The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, introducing another lecture series covering groundbreaking orchestral repertoire. This time around, it's my great pleasure to bring you Arnold Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra. Among the great musical works that exploded the role of the orchestra into the 20th century, Schoenberg's Five Pieces appears to be a bit of a dark horse candidate. Audiences will tend to be much more familiar with the Rite of Spring, the Planets, La Mer, Daphnis and Chloe, and any number of symphonies and concert works by Strauss and Mahler. Even Bruckner's last few symphonies will have been programmed with more regularity than Schoenberg's Five Pieces. And yet I'd argue that the Five Pieces for Orchestra has made as much, if not even more, impact on orchestral music than many other works of that period over the past 100 years. But not just contemporary composers carrying on in the tradition of atonal music. Film and television composers are constantly going back to the well of Schoenberg's opus, and reinterpreting his ideas in hundreds of different ways. To be clear about this from the very beginning, I myself am not a composer of atonal music. In fact, I'm an unashamed composer of tonal music in a populist vein. And yet I'm fascinated by the textures, colors, and ideas that Schoenberg scored into this early masterpiece, and I find them quite stimulating to my own sense of musical inspiration. And I'm not the only one. As I've mentioned before in other lectures, Gustav Holst's Planet Suite was directly influenced by Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra. In fact, Holst's original title for his work was Seven Pieces for Large Orchestra. But the evolving musical imagery, along with his fascination for astrology, led Holst to name each movement after a corresponding planet. Schoenberg's biography and the theoretical principles of his music have been covered by many, many other writers whose specialized knowledge is much greater than mine. All I really want to focus on in these lectures is the orchestration, and what you can learn from it for your own craft. But let's cover in the briefest way some of the background of how this piece came to be written, so you have a little bit of context of how it fits into the grand scope of orchestral works of its time. For a whole decade from the 1890s to the 1900s, Schoenberg's music had been evolving, from his early admiration of Brahms to more post-romantic explorations with works of vast thematic scope and length, which had caught the attention of those giants of the age, Richard Strauss and Gustav Mahler. Their patronage opened doors for him in his career, especially in becoming an established music educator in Berlin. But his rising career was not without crisis. In 1908, his wife left him for another man, and even though she eventually reconciled and returned to him, Schoenberg had other professional frustrations and setbacks around this time. His response was to release a mighty tide of music, each breaking down tonality a little more as they progressed. The second string quartet, his song cycle, The Book of Hanging Gardens, The Three Pieces for Piano, and the monodrama, Erwartung, the last of which was composed in only two weeks. It was around this time that Strauss mentioned that he'd been looking for works to present at his concerts at the Berlin Hofkapelle. Schoenberg wrote back to him to mention a new series of works. Short orchestral pieces, between one and three minutes long, not cyclically related. I have finished three of them. A fourth will take at most a few days, and perhaps two or three more will be born later. I'm expecting colossal things of them, sound and mood especially. That is what they are about, absolutely not symphonic, precisely the opposite, no architecture, no structure, merely a bright, uninterrupted interchange of colors, rhythms, and moods. With this work, The Five Pieces for Orchestra, Schoenberg made a final break with tonal composition and opened up a new field for himself and his followers, which is now called the Second Viennese School. 
What I find the most interesting about this artistic moment is that it was through orchestration that Schoenberg found his liberation. The quest toward more random sounding events absolutely required avoiding tonal strategies, and orchestral colors provided the key for that expression. At this time, Schoenberg called this approach total chromaticism, and would later refer to this breakthrough period as pantonalism. He disliked the term atonality. By freeing music of the need to resolve or modulate or establish any tonal center, his gestures could be completely subjective, with absolute freedom of emotional scope. In this way, Schoenberg became the founder of expressionism in music, and a dominant influence on contemporary composers throughout the coming century. But it was a step too far for Richard Strauss. He could abide the concept of tonality extended almost to the breaking point, but not beyond it. As a result, the five pieces for orchestra would not be performed at the Berlin Hofkapelle. Instead, of all places, Albert Hall in London became the 1912 premier venue, with the indefatigable Henry Wood conducting the Proms Orchestra. The reaction was predictably mixed, with some laughter and hissing, but also ardent and vigorous applause. To many British musicians, it made an indelible impression. The 1912 publication of the score made it possible for composers like Gustav Holst to take the piece home and study it at length, after he heard a repeat performance conducted by Schoenberg himself in 1914. And from there, the five pieces for orchestra have cautiously established their place in the repertoire, thanks largely to the continued enthusiasm of discerning conductors, who recognized the piece as a tour de force in conducting, alongside its uncompromising inspiration and artistry. The five pieces for orchestra were revised several times over the next 60 years, but the two main versions that orchestrators should study are the original 1909 version and the 1949 revision. While I'll be using the later version in my lectures, both are worth checking out. The instrumentation of the 1909 version takes us into the grand scope of early 20th century scoring, and would have been easily manageable for a Richard Strauss-sized orchestra. Quadruple woodwinds with quintuple clarinets, Notice the doublings allowing for a second piccolo and a contrabass clarinet. Two piccolos is something we also see in Holst's planets, and this score might have given him the courage to ask for that much top-end power. While contrabass clarinet was probably the most problematic element in the lineup, Schoenberg fearlessly asks for a contrabass clarinet in A, which may have been built once or twice, but would have been completely out of reach for pretty much every orchestra, and still is today. If a contrabass clarinet was actually used, it would have been a B-flat model borrowed from a professional military band, and even then, it might be extremely unlikely that the average third clarinetist could play the quite active part that Schoenberg scored. It might be just as likely that the average conductor might cobble together something that the contrabassoonist could play, adding the contrabass clarinet lines to their part. It's interesting as well that the great English orchestration teacher of that day, Cecil Forsyth, mentions the use of the contrabass clarinet in the Albert Hall premiere of the five pieces, though he seemingly can't bring himself to mention Schoenberg by name. The brass section is also in line with scoring by Strauss and Mahler. Six horns, also reflected in Holst's planets, three trumpets, four trombones, and tuba. Extra trombones were a given back then, but once again there's a parallel with Holst's planets. If the function of the extra trombone is given over to a tenor tuba, the same number of low heavy brass is achieved. Timpani and percussion are mostly pretty standard, and used mostly in fairly conventional ways. That is to say, there are a few special techniques employed, except notably for bowed cymbal in the fourth movement. 
Yet again, we can see the influence on Holst, through the generous scoring of the celesta and the occasional use of thematic lines on the timpani. That simply leaves harp and strings. The string scoring is pretty free for its time, with fairly complex writing and generous special effects such as mutes, harmonics, flautando, tremolo, sul ponticello, and sul g. It's a great score in which to study the colors that can result from such effects. As for the harp, here's a situation where Schoenberg might easily have scored for two harps, for more tone weight and for better ease of harp pedaling. He often overestimates the strength of the harp, at least according to the common perception of orchestral balance. In Schoenberg's 1949 revision, he left the percussion, strings, and harp parts pretty much the way they were, but he reduces the amount of wind and brass players by half a dozen total. Gone is the third oboe and third bassoon, and the third clarinet part is cut from the score along with its doubling of contrabass clarinet. While this reduced the budget along with the onstage crowding, it distributed the notes in those parts amongst the remaining players, making their overall task that much busier and more challenging. The brass also lose three players, with six horns down to a standard four, and the fourth trombone part cut entirely. While this reduction of heavy hitters might appear to weaken the texture a bit, there's no loss of power in the revised version. The brass still scream. In the revision, Schoenberg mentions that the conductor need not try to polish sounds which seem unbalanced, but watch that every instrumentalist plays accurately the prescribed dynamic according to the nature of his instrument. There are no motives in this piece which have to be brought to the fore. Nevertheless, he provides Hauptstimme markings, these bracketed signs based on the letter H which point out foreground elements. These were absent from the original version, and despite his best intentions, there are certain elements that don't balance at all. For instance, this passage in which the strings simply disappear under the onslaught of the massive brass, and indeed are even marked to be softer and softer. In his letter to Strauss, Schoenberg claimed that the five pieces had no architecture, no structure. And yet there are quite noticeable structures and strategies running through each movement. Sometimes it's simply a long chord that underpins all the action or the reiteration and development of certain motives. In the third movement, Schoenberg deliberately shifts from one chord color to the next, like a lighting technician slowly dimming one colored light and fading in another. In the final movement, the so-called obligato recitative uses the same rhythmic plan 17 times, and throughout the entire suite, the qualities of counterpoint and thematic development are masterfully integrated. What's fun for me at this point in time, 110 years after it was written, is to hear all the parts that have been quoted by film and television composers. Snatches of the second movement in particular have showed up all over the place, when the director needs a certain kind of unsettling sweetness in a scene. And of course, the eerie, floating back and forth winds have been a staple since they were quoted in Goldsmith's score to Alien. There are some decided differences between Holst and Schoenberg, however. Where Holst tailored specific ensembles for each movement from within the overall instrumentation, Schoenberg generally employs the complete ensemble throughout the entire work, with a few changes here or there. For instance, timpani and contrabass clarinet are only used in the first movement of the original 1909 version, while third clarinet is restricted to the last two movements but instruments that you might expect to be occasional visitors are used throughout, like the Sopranino clarinet. The result is that even though the music explores many different textures and colors, there's still a certain unity throughout. Any movement might easily be recognized as part of the whole. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be using the 1949 version in my lectures. 
My reasons are twofold. First, I feel that this second major look at the material by Schoenberg fixes a lot of the looseness in the ensemble, and is generally a more disciplined bit of scoring, though the ultimate effect is pretty much the same as the original version. Second, it's the version you're probably going to hear at the concert hall in these days of more realistic orchestra budgets. So you might as well carry around that impression in your head as an orchestrator, concert musician, and possibly even as a conductor. Something else that you'll note about my lectures is that I freely make use of the movement titles that Schoenberg's publishers asked of him for yet another revision in 1922. He was a bit dubious about the value of titling each piece, as he wrote in his diary. The wonderful thing about music is that it allows you to express everything so the initiates will understand, but without betraying your inmost secrets, the secrets you don't confess even to yourself. But titles betray you after all. Moreover, the music already expresses the ideas that are important, so why use words? If words were necessary, you would use them in the first place, whereas in art you can express more than in words. Anyway, the titles I might use betray no secrets, because they are either very cryptic or very technical. Thus, 1. Premonitions. Everyone has them. 2. The Past. Everyone has one of those, too. 3. Chord Colors. Just technical. 4. Peripatia. Vague enough, I suppose. 5. The Obligato, or perhaps fully developed or endless recitative. But there should be a note to say that these titles were added as a necessity of publication, and not to provide poetic atmosphere. I've already released the first three lectures covering the bombastic first movement exclusively to supporters over on Patreon. My lectures on the deliciously spooky second movement will be released in a few days on the same platform, with more to come over the next few months. I'm really enjoying producing these lectures right now. As with any great work, I'm learning an enormous amount as I share my perspectives as an orchestrator. I hope that you'll get as much out of these pieces as me. See you soon.